Sir, can you hear me? Sir, are you audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. You can proceed with your session, sir. Please. Here, first one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir. Please respond. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can. Yes, hear sir. Me. You can yes, proceed. Sir. Yes, yes, sir. You, yes, you can sir. take on the session. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I hope you can see my screen. First of all, I would like to congratulate all the coordinators of this online Atal FDP on recent trends and advancements in ANN and deep learning for real time applications. So in this session, I'm going to demonstrate uh, various aspects of various features of Python, right? I hope uh, the upcoming sessions on this artificial neural network and uh, this deep learning, uh, they will demonstrate hands-on sessions, right? Using Python. Python is the best uh, language for demonstrating these deep learning uh, algorithms. That's why they have given me a session on Python. So let us demonstrate, let me demonstrate some features of Python. So basically this Python, you can run this Python long Python programs either offline or online. If you have installed some editor on your system, then you can simply run your programs. But in this session, I'm going to demonstrate the features of Python using an online environment called Google Colab. I request all the participants to open this Google Colab. Please search for Google Colab. And then you can open the first link you will get. It's welcome to collaboratory Google research. You can open the first link. So this is the online platform for, so here you can click on new notebook. You can click on new notebook. So you'll get a screen like this. Now if you see here, let me give a brief description about the environment. You can, you can give a name to your workbook. Right, this is a this is called notebook. You can give a name to your notebook. Let us say Atal FDP on ANN and deep learning. Let us say I have renamed it. Similarly, here we have two things one is code, the other one is text. Right, so this code is the cell in which you can run Python program or Python commands. Whereas, text this cell, if you open this cell, in this cell, you can write some uh, headings. Let us say basics of python i want to write basics of basics of python this way you can write so this is called text cell so whatever you write this text cell will be displayed this is not for running this is just for displaying you see this is basics of python so this can be used for writing headings subheadings and so on right now we'll proceed with this code cell so code cell is a place where we'll write Python commands and we can run the Python commands. Now, let me start with uh, basic variable declaration and all these things, right? Uh, keeping in mind uh, that the participants, uh, some of the participants are new to Python. So in Python, you can declare a variable simply. Simple means very simple. You see, if you want to define a variable X and you want to assign a value, value, assign it, that's all. Now I request all the participants to write the commands and run with me so that it will be useful for you. Anyhow, after uh, at the end of the session, I will share the I will share this notebook also, but I request all the participants to run the commands with me. Now you see the variable declaration and assignment of value in Python is very simple. You see, we are not declaring any data type. We are simply assigning to the variable, right? That's all. Now, if you want to assign some value, y equals to 5.6, you can assign, that's all. If you want to run this uh, cell, you please click on this one. Or you can press Control Enter. Are you with me? Are you able to run? Are you able to open Google Colab and run these commands? Please respond in chat box. Are you able to are you able to open Google Colab and uh, able to execute these commands? Yes, okay. If you are able to run these commands, that is well and good. Okay. So 
Now you see similarly, you can do dead. Let us say NIT Warangal. Now you see, I was able to assign an integer value to the variable, a floating point value to the variable, and also a string value to the variable. Now, now let us see what is the value, what is the data type of x. So we have a command called type. Type of x. If you write, what is type of x? It is int. Because we have assigned an integer value, so it is it was written an integer. Now let me open new cell. You can click here so that new cell will be opened. Now let me see what is the type of y. Type of y, you see, it will be float, right? Similarly, if you see type of z, it will automatically tell you that it is string. the value that was stored in the variable is string. So basically, Python is a dynamically typed language. That means there is no need to define data type of a variable. It will automatically infer the data type of the variable based on the value you are assigning. Right? So there is no need to define the data type of the variable. You can simply write variable name, assign the value. It is very simple. Right? You can assign any value. Integer, floating point value, string, you can do all these things. And then now, so this is the way we assign values, we declare variables. So there is a predefined rules. There are some predefined rules to define a variable also. Name cannot type with a suppose if you give a variable name as one year. One year equals to ten. If you try to define a variable like this, it will throw an error saying variable name or a method name or a class name cannot start with cannot start with a zip. So therefore I'm writing here. So identifier name identifier name should not start with a digit. Right? It can have digits, it can have uh, characters A to small a to z, capital A to z, but it, it cannot start with it. It should not start with a digit. What is an identifier? Identifier is a name given to a very So if you are writing a class name or function name or a variable. Rao, sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. yeah. Sir, Please. actually your voice is somewhat little bit of, uh, breaking. Means uh, it is not breaking clear. Little bit. Uh, uh, I was near the mic only. <laughs> Can you hear me now? You want me to? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You? No, it is good. Somewhat good. Better than that. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. You can continue. Yeah, yeah. So these these are the rules. An identifier name. Identifier name means a function name or a method name or a class name or a variable name. It should not start with a zip. Now, let us move on. So after defining some variables, let us say equals to ten, b equals to five. After defining variables, what is the next thing we do in programming? We apply various kind of operations. So Python supports all kind of operations. Supports arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, plus, minus. So all these operations support plus, minus, bar, divided by, and so on. Right? All these operations it will support. Similarly, it supports logical operations. It supports bitwise operations. All these operations it supports. So I'm not going to explore all these operations. Right? Because if you want to perform uh, left shift or right shift, this is a left shift operation. Left, left shift, A. See? Because it was A by 10 times. So if you want to left shift A by once, you give like this. This is shifting A, left shift A by one. So it will, as, as you know, if you left shift a number, it will double, right? 10 becomes 20. If you left shift times, then it will. 10 becomes 20, 20 becomes 40, right? So all these operations are performed uh, with these variables. So I'm not going to present all the operations, but I'm going to present some of the operations that will be useful. So the operations are like this. Some of the operations are div mod. So Python operation called div mod. So what is the use of this div mod? Let me write here. A equals to 10, B equals to 3. Do mod of 
a comma b so this div mod stands for division and modulo so it will perform division operation and it will so that means what it will give quotient and remainder let me execute mod of a comma b so it will return 3 and 1 3 is the quotient one is the remainder it will it will return both quotient and remainder there are many other functions we will see all these functions but let me introduce some of the other data types so the other data okay before we introduce the other data types let me tell you how to read input from user so in python you can read input from user also so there is a command called input input here you can write enter a number yes that means it will be display on on your screen now let us see let me run this one then what happens you see so you see whatever string entered here it was coming here and it was it was asking for input let me give some input 15 i have given 15 and i press enter so if you see by default by default it will take the input as string you see this is a string now let me introduce strings also you can convert strings into an integer using int this is like type conversion you see now let me give now 18 now you see the number is 18 and you can store this in some variable also it is up to you let me give some 78 now 78 was stored in c you can see the value of c 78 was there you see so this way you can read the input user now let me briefly introduce strings in python let then let me go to uh, some other data types called collection data types but before that let me introduce strings strings in python you can write a string with quotes so that is like this and i do tell you or you can use double quotes double quotes means what double quotes or triple quotes triple quotes means this one this is called triple quote So in Python, you can define strings using this single quote, double quote, triple quote. So the question is, what is the difference between single quote, double quote, triple quote? Are they same, or is there any difference between single quote, double quote, and triple quote? If they are same, then why Python designers found differences? They are different. What is the difference? Now let us see. They are not same actually. They are designed for different purposes. So basically, the single code, single code was designed to store. Hello, hello, Rao sir. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, there is still some issue with your uh, that uh, voice. It is breaking. I think some internet issue. Maybe I don't. Oh, internet issue. Uh, you can out. keep uh, some distance with your mic. Uh, okay, distance. Okay. okay. Now is it okay? Okay, sir. You can continue, sir. Please, sir. Is it okay now? Is still any issue? Yes, sir. It's now so okay. Now what? Okay. 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 One moment. Please, please continue, sir. Is it okay? Okay, let me continue. Yes, sir. Please continue. Yeah. So this single quote was designed to store a sequence of characters, a sequence of characters without any spaces. So that means it was designed to store strings. Whereas double quotes, it was designed to store a line. that means sequence of words you can store this triple quote was designed to store a paragraph now let us see the difference between single quote and double quote now here you see what happens if i write a sequence of strings in s1 now because s1 single quote was designed to store sequence of characters now what happens if we store like this nit varangal 
does it return any error no it will not return any error now let me write the same thing in s2 i see both are working although single quotes were designed to store a single string it was storing strings with uh, spaces also now what is the difference the difference comes here now if you store s1 equals to let us say uh, something uh, okay let me write nit is nit students students you see i'm using a single quote inside this string now if you use like this it will throw an error because i have used a single quote inside the single quotes now if you want to store strings like this you can go for double quotes you can go for double quotes now you see we are able to store nit students in s1 now let us see what is there in s1 now s1 contains You see, NIT students. That the single quote was part of the string, so which we are unable to store using single quotes, but we are able to store using double quotes. Now, similarly, if you use a double quote, double quote for writing a paragraph. Let me write a paragraph like this for Angle. Two lines. Now it will throw an error. So for this case, you can use triple quote. Now you go and store in triple quote. Now what happens? You see. it works without any errors you see right so if you see what is there in s2 what is there in s2 you can see that we are able to store a paragraph paragraph means at least two lines were there here this is first line this is second line so we were able to store these two lines using this three quotes right so this is the difference between the single quote double quote and triple quote now let me move on i have introduced this idea of strings so in addition to these basic data types integers floating points characters strings python supports something known as collection data types so what is this collection data type so the name itself indicates that you see the name collection collection means what collection means many many items so basically this collection data type stores multiple items so so far we have defined variables right the variables can store only one value so they are like arrays in our uh, other programming languages so array means what it, it it can store many items but they are homogeneous now let us see some of the collection data types so python basically supports five collection data types they are list tuple list tuple set dictionary dictionary and string basically string is what it was storing a sequence of characters that's why it is also called a collection data type let us see the other things so i'm not going to spend much time on these strings but i'm i will spend some time on these things list tuple set and dictionary now first let us start with list so what is this list list means okay it is a collection data type this so basically it supports it can store multiple items right now define a list so if you have to define an empty list you use this square brackets so anything that you define using this square bracket is a list now you can check this what is the data type of this list data type of l using type See, type of L is what? Type of L is a list. Am I going uh, fast? Is it okay? Are you want me to slow down? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now, if you want to define a list. with some items you can define like this 1 2 3 4 okay so there are multiple items multiple elements were there in this list so it means it is similar to your array no not exactly now let me write l equals to 1 comma 2.2 you see here 
So what is there in L? You can see. So we have stored an integer. We have stored a floating point value. Similarly, you can store a string also. You can store a string also here. Let us say, let me write n i t w. So this, therefore, it will tell you that list is not homogeneous. List can store multiple elements, but the elements can be of different data types. One integer, one floating point, one string. It can store list also. So that means that means what we can give here a list itself. That means four, five, six. I'm giving one more list inside this list. So that's why it is called heterogeneous. It can store items of different data types. So this is the first characteristic of list. It stores multiple items, and the items can belong to different data types. So therefore, list is heterogeneous. This is the first thing. Basically, list is heterogeneous, right? Now, what is the second characteristic of this list? List is ordered. Ordered means what? Anything. That has ordered can be accessed using index. So let me access the elements of this list using index. So what is L of zero? So in in Python, index starts with zero. So what is L of zero? One. What is L of three? What is L of three? This is zero. This is one. This is two. This is three. Right. So three means the entire list it is returning. So this is called ordering. So Python is uh, means the list is ordered, so you can access individual elements using index. So you can access uh, in Python the index starts with zero. Now the other feature that is supported Python is negative indexing. So suppose you wanted to access the last element of this list, how do you access the last element of this list? First of all, you have to know the size. Suppose you know that the list contains four elements: one, two, three, four. Then you can access it using L of three. So if you know size, you can access the last element using L of size minus one. But it may not be means what uh, the size of the list may not be available all the times. So if the size of the list is not available, that means what you have a long list and you don't know the size of the list. Then how do you access the last element? For that, you have to know the size of the list. But in Python, there is no need to, there is no need to know the size of the list. You can access the last element simply using L of minus one. What is L of minus one? L of minus one is returning the last element. So this is called negative indexing. So L of minus one means last element. Minus one stands for last element. What is minus two? What is minus two? Second last element. What is minus three? Third last element, and so on. Minus one means last element. Minus two means second last element. Minus three means third last element, and so on. Are we clear so far? Any questions? Any questions with this uh, indexing? Indexing, no issues, I hope. But this negative indexing. Okay, I will slow down. Opasana, I will slow. I will go slowly. No issue. Okay, so Python supports negative indexing. Now, what is the other uh, features of this list? You can access a subpart of this list. So, what is this list? You see here, the list contains four elements. Now, suppose you wanted to access these two elements. So, this is called slicing. Slicing means what? You can take. You can access. Part of the list. Now, suppose you wanted to access second and third element. Second element means what? Index is one, and third element, right? That means first index one and index two. You wanted to access, so you can access like this. This is called slicing. So that means what? You want the system to return the first index and second index, but does not include third index. So one, two, three means it will return. Index one and index two. Is it clear? What is index one? Two point two. What is index two? An ITW. So if you give one two four, then it will return index one, index two, index three. 
so whatever you give here it will not include this starting from 1 it will go up to 4 minus 1 i hope it is clear now so this is called slicing you can access part of the list suppose you want to access this to help suppose you have a big list let me write a big list one let me give some random numbers three four one two five six three eight nine ten this is your list and what is there in your list you see now suppose you wanted to access this part of the list how you will access this is zero one two three so from three four five six seven so three to seven you wanted to access then what you will give you will give three column eight it will return third element third means index th index three index four index five index six index seven it will not include index eight okay so list is heterogeneous list is ordered right now you see here we used we entered key two times right so that means what list supports duplicate elements also so list supports duplicate elements this is one more feature first one is it is heterogeneous second one is that it is ordered that means you can access individual elements using index and python supports negative indexing so you can access elements of the list using negative indexing also and then you can access a part of the list using this slicing now what happens if you use this slicing with negative indexing let me give minus 1 2 minus 4 that means what you wanted to access the last uh, three elements you wanted to access let me run this now what it is returning it is returning nothing it is giving empty why why it, it is not working with these negative indexes because the default the step length is positive that means after index 3 where it will go it should go to index 4 after index 4 where it go index 5 so that means the movement is in the positive direction now you are you want to move in the negative direction so you should give a step length here the third argument third argument is step length this is minus 1 to minus 4 with the step length of minus 1 so that means you see here this is the last element second last element last element it will not go to the fourth last element any questions here any questions so far any questions with this positive indexing negative indexing slicing slicing with negative index yeah uh, dr krishnan dr krishnan no? which one you want me to explain everything are only negative indexing last one okay so you see when we have given this two slicing with positive indexing three to eight that means what index three what is index three this is zero one two three index three index four index five index six index seven seven up to seven it will go three to seven it will go eight it will not include so that means what the movement was in the positive direction after index three three plus one index four four plus one index 5 5 plus 1 index 6 so that means the moving was in the positive direction after index 3 you are going to index 4 so that is called step length so from uh, index 3 you are going to index 4 index 4 to index 5 and so on right whereas if you omit this one it will take the same thing it was trying to move in the positive direction but you are already at the last step right so that's why it was returning negative uh, nothing exactly what you want to do you want to return in this direction right so that's why you have to give minus one to minus four you should give minus one so that means what you are telling the system to move in the direction so it was like this if this is equivalent to if this is equivalent to for for i equals to three i equals to three i less than eight i plus plus so by default it will be it will go in this plus plus i plus plus now this is equivalent to what this is equivalent to for i runs from 
the last element let me write last element as uh, let us say 7 okay here uh, last element is what 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 let us say 9 last element and we are more we are going up to a 9 8 7 right i greater than or equals to 7 i minus minus so this minus one is for this one this increment is it clear yeah that's all that's why you are giving this minus one this is it acts like i minus minus that's all. okay okay now we'll move on so 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 far what we have seen list is heterogeneous list is added list supports duplicate values now the other feature we'll see now so list is mutable mutable means what you can add elements you can delete elements you can update existing elements that means what is the content of l this is the content of l now the content is it fixed means is it static or dynamic that's what we mean by mutable so once we define a list can we add more elements to the list can we delete existing elements to the list can we update existing elements from the list yes we can do all these operations that's why it is called mutable now we'll see one by one now let us say i want to add an element to this list how to add an element to the list there is a function called append using this one you can add any element let me add an it work i'm adding now let us see what is there in l what is there in l you see an element was added but where it was added it was added at the end but you see we were able to add element right so you can add element now the question is okay i i can add element but i don't want to add at the end i want to add somewhere in between so does it support yes it supports how to then how to add at the intermediate step let us say i want to add in between so there is a function called insert where you want to insert let us say this is 0 1 2 3 4 5 i want to index i want to insert at index so you give 5 and let me give my name uh, so let us see what is there in l you can run these commands you see now 0 1 2 3 4 5 you see at index 5 the input that i have given was added right instead of raw you can give a number you can give a integer you can give a floating point value you can give a list also no issue right so you see we are able to append an element but this append function will always append at the end so if you want to insert in between then use this function insert so let me post this in chat box so that it will be useful for you so yes it is dynamic So let me post so that it will be you can run these commands directly you see so that is the list you have created now you can append an element you can insert an element also you can run these commands right so you can append at the end or you can append in between also you can insert in between also okay now now what else we can do so as i said you can insert a list also not necessarily l, l dot insert let me say i want to add at four index four i want to add a list now right 23 34 45 i want to add this yeah i have added now let us see what is there in this what is there in this l what is there in the cell now you see so list was added as it is but suppose you wanted to add you don't want to add this list as it is you want to add elements of this list let us say how do you add elements of the list so for that there is a function called extend l dot extend 
let me give some other list 34 45 67 this is the list i am adding but i am adding now using extend function right now what happens when you add using extend function let me show you the output let me show you the output what happens when you add a list using extend function the elements of the list was added it was not added as it is so this is the difference between append and extend is it clear the difference between append and extend so append will add as it is whatever you append it will add so if it is a single element that is okay but when you have we either insert or append the same thing same thing you can uh, give append also no issue so either insert or append when you add a list the list was added as it is now you you don't want to add the list you want to add elements of the list let us say then what you will you use you will use a function called extend so i hope it is clear the difference between append and extend is it clear Yeah. Okay. Now let us see. Okay. So these are the functions we are adding, right? And insert, extend. Now let us try to update existing elements. Now let us say I want to update this element. Let us say. So this is zero, one, two, three. So I want to update. So what I do? I simply use indexing. So I will go to L four, and then what I will write. i will write something here so small n i t w i will write i'll replace so what is the, what does this will do this command will write power we'll write the content of fourth index now let us see what is there in l what is there in l this fourth item index 4 the element at index 4 was replaced with small n i t w right so this is for updation now the question is okay i want to update A particular element, this one. So, if you want to update this element, what do you need? You need the index, right? So, will you manually check? Will you manually go and check and will you replace? So, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Will you manually uh, check the index of this element and then you will will you replace? That is not possible all the times. If your list is very long, then how will you find the index of a element manually it is very a difficult task right so for that there is a function here that is called index so l dot index of index of i want to find index of the element row you see what is the element of index row this six so this index function returns index of element now suppose you want to overwrite You want to overwrite this element. How will you overwrite? How will you overwrite first? Find index of the element. So this function will return index of element. Now use this as a index. Use this as a index of L. Now let us say this row. I want to replace with row. Now what happens after replacing? Let us let me see what is there in L. What is there in L? You see, earlier R small a small o was there. It was replaced with row. So you can find the index of an element. Then you can overwrite. So both ways we have seen. If you know the index, you can simply replace existing element. If you don't know the element, if you don't know the index of the element. find the index of the element place are we clear are we clear this index if you have any questions with this indexing please let me know okay we were able to add elements we are able to update elements also now what is remaining can we delete elements yes we can delete elements also so there is a function called pop so if you simply use the pop function what it will do it will return the last element it will remove the last element it will not just return you see what is there in l it will remove the last element you see last element was deleted so now you 
see the append function and pop function. If you observe closely, this append function and close function will add at the last index, right? It will append at the ending. Now this pop, pop function, what it will do? It will remove from the, it will remove the last element, right? So this is exactly the stack operation, last in first out operation. So the stack can be simply implemented using list, using the second operation and pop operation. Is it clear? Because stack, how the stack works, what is the, whatever is the element that was added at the last, it will be removed first. When you push an element, it will be added at the top, right? When you pop it, the first, the top element will be deleted. So therefore, using the second and pop functions, you can simply implement a stack functionality. So the stack functionality can be implemented using the list, using this append and pop functions. Are we clear? Yeah, okay. Now, now the question is, okay, so we were able to delete the last element. So can we delete some other element, not just last element? Can I delete something else? based on index, can I delete? Yes, you can delete. Simply to this pop function, if you supply index, let us say, I want to delete this one, let us say. So this is zero, one, two, three, four. So how to delete? You simply give index four. So it is not L2, oh no, L. So you see NITW was deleted. You can check the content of L. Yes, yes, let me go ahead. Uh, to what extent I pasted L at index row. So these are the commands I'm pasting. First, let me paste these commands so that you can run these commands. L dot pop and L dot pop of four. Okay, if there are two parameters in L, how can we use replace command? Two parameters, uh, what do you mean by two parameters? So you, you mean by dimension, two dimensions? Okay, same values that you, you want to, okay, I, I understood your question. So here, three was there here, three was here, right? So the index function, yeah, that's what, yeah, three was here two times. I understood your question. So three was there two times. So the index function, what it will return basically, it will return the first instance of three. If you see, let me write the function L dot index, L dot index of three, what it will return? It will return the first appearance of three, which is zero. At zeroth index, it was there. So it will be replaced. So if you want to replace it, replace all the appearances of three, then you have to, there is no built-in function, you have to do on your own. Are we clear? Yeah. Okay, now, so far what we are able to do, we are able to delete the last element using L dot pop. You are able to remove element based on index, it's also possible. Now suppose what if I want to remove this now, this element? Is it possible with pop and index? Pop and remove? No. So there is a function called remove. So with pop, it is not possible. There is a function called remove. Now you supply the element. Let's say I want to remove this element. You can simply remove. You see what is there in L? Now the element raw was no longer there. It was removed. See, so we can remove element based on index. You can remove the last element or you can remove the element based on content also. So are we clear so far? So this is the, these are the features of list. So what are the features of list? It is heterogeneous. It is ordered, it supports duplicate elements. It is mutable. Okay. 
So we are done with this list. Now let me move on. So we'll go to something called tuple. So this tuple is very simple. Basically, tuple is also heterogeneous. Now how to store a tuple? Suppose you want to define a tuple, you use these brackets. So this way you can define a tuple. Now suppose you want to give some elements. One, two point two, and eighty W. So anything that is between these brackets is a tuple, right? See, this is a tuple. So therefore, it is heterogeneous, right? We are able to store integer, floating point, string, and so on. So it is heterogeneous. Okay, now we'll see. Is it ordered? Yes, it is ordered. You can access the elements. You see, T of what is this capital T? T of one. What it will give you? It will give the element at first index. It was written in two point two. Similarly, you can check. It supports negative indexing also. It supports slicing also. So tuple is heterogeneous. Tuple is ordered. Now, what is the difference between tuple and uh, what list? So the difference is that tuple is not mutable. It is immutable. That means you once you define a tuple with three elements, then you are done. It is static. You are not able to add elements. You are not able to delete elements. You are not able to delete elements also. Is it clear? The tuple. So therefore, the only functions that is supported by this tuple is this index function. E dot index. If you want to find the index of an element, you can perform. You can done this using this function. But there are no other functions to add elements, to delete elements, and so on. And it supports a more function called count. It will count. And in fact, list also supports this function. T dot count. How many times an element appears? See, NITW appears only once. Is it clear? So these are the only two functions that is supported by tuple. Any questions on the tuple? So it is heterogeneous, ordered, immutable. Once you define a tuple with some elements, then it is like uh, fixed, static. Yeah, and then you can explore other things also. Does it support duplicate elements? Does it support duplicate elements? Yes, it supports duplicate elements. You can cross check all these things. Let me define one more tuple. Let me, let me write T one. Let me write one. Yes, it was working. That means it supports duplicate elements also. It supports duplicate elements also. Now the question is, what is the purpose of this tuple? As uh, someone has asked, that, what is the purpose of this tuple, Dr. Suri Prasad? Now you see, if the content is fixed, what is the need of this tuple? So earlier we have seen a function div mod. You see, if you use div mod of ten comma nine, you do use this div mod of ten comma nine. What is the result? Can you see the result? Format of the result. The output is a tuple, a tuple, right? So if you see, tuple is useful in situations wherein you don't want to change the result. Result is fixed. You see, when you perform this demand operation between these two parameters, the result is fixed. It does not change. The number of arguments, number of uh, what, number of values in the output is two. It does not change because demand will always return. Two values, right? That's why the number of uh, values it will return is fixed, and the value, the exact value of each, each of these return values is also fixed. So in those kind of situations, this tuple is useful. Are we clear, Dr. Suri Prasad? Yeah. So this tuple will be useful in situations wherein. Result will be 
it will not change right constant so okay now we are done with this triple alt this triple is very simple heterogeneous ordered suppose duplicate but it is mutable now the other uh, collection data type is set so this set is also very simple so that set is what the mathematical definition of set that was implemented using this set so if you want to implement a set you use a function set if you give a list 1234523234 then it will return a set so we have to use something called set this function whereas in list we used square brackets in tuple we used this parentheses whereas in set we have to use a function set now what is the output you see what is there in s what is there in s so this is the mathematical definition of set right it does not support duplicates although i have i have repeated 2 3 4 two times it was taking only once so it does not support duplicates right as it support uh, it was in a elements as it supports it was in a element you can cross check let me write one more uh, cell does it support duplicate elements duplicate elements it supports as it supports it was in a elements let us see whether it supports or not what is there in s yes it supports you see 2 is different from 2.2 so it supports heterogeneous elements right but it does not supports duplicate elements now what is the next thing so basically set is heterogeneous but it does not support duplicate elements does it have any order set does not does not have any order so if you if there is if you want to access elements using index then what will return error saying that set object is not subscriptable not subscriptable means what not subscriptable means what no order it does not have any order like this is the first element this is the first element second element third element so this kind of ordering was not there in the set so let me keep it so that you will know that uh, it does not support ordering okay so far is are we clear heterogeneous no duplicates and no ordering yeah if we are clear now now let us go to the mute property so set can we add elements can we delete elements can we update elements from the set yes set is mutable so that means you can add elements you can delete elements also now suppose you want to add element add an element s dot add let me add something 45 yes it was added see what is there in s 45 was added so do you think the element was added at the last can you can you run this function and see the output where exactly it was added let me add one more element 46 so since set has no ordering so this add function will simply add that's all there is no ordering although it was showing here there is no order right so therefore there are no functions insert at some place Yes, there is no ordering. There is no position. So then, how will you insert at a particular place? 
right? So therefore, the only function that is supported by set per addition is this add function. Are we clear? Now, are we clear? Yeah. Now suppose you want to remove element. So okay, now pop function will work. S dot pop. S dot pop. It will do. You see. Okay, Dr. Krishna no Kundu. Will it add only at the end? There is no ordering, so there is no concept of starting and ending. Right? Set, set does not have any order. So it was showing, just for showing, it was showing here, that's all. Here, that's all. So you see, when we remove, yeah, no order. Yeah, when we remove, is it removing from the end? No, because there is no order. It will simply randomly remove. You can uh, run this function multiple times, then you will find the difference. I'm, I'm only running, you see, now here, you see, here you can see at least. First time it has written, it has removed this element. Second time it has removed this element. You see, it will randomly pick some element and it will delete. So therefore there is no order. Are we clear? Yes. So if you add an element, it will be added to the list. There is no ordering. First, last, in between, some index, nothing. Similarly, when you delete element also, it will simply delete an element, some element of the set. Okay, now let me summarize the set. So it is heterogeneous, does not support duplicates, no order. It is mutable, mutable uh, with the set certain uh, functions only because due to this no ordering so far any questions set list triple any questions yeah we cannot use remove with sets yeah you can use remove remove you can use since remove does not depend on uh, index if you want to remove an element you supply an element. If the element is there, it will remove. Let, let me remove what is there in S. Let me see what is the content of S. And this is the content of S. Let me remove 4, 5, 6. 4, 5, 6. See, it was removed. You see, 4, 5, 6 was removed. So if you supply an element, it will delete. But indexing will not work because there is no ordering. Okay, where do we use these sets, right? So, this sets, the idea of sets will be useful. Suppose you have a list, right? From this list, you want to access only uh, unique elements, right? Then what we do is simply convert this list into set. That is one use, I'm telling one simple uh, application wherein we use these sets. The other applications includes these mathematical people, they use these sets very frequently. So these sets, they support all kind of mathematical operations like union. So let me demonstrate those things. Let us say, what is S1? Let us say one, two, three, four, five. Let us say S2. S2 is, okay, this is set actually. This is set. Similarly, I have one more set. So we have two sets. Now, if we want to perform union operation between S1 and S2, simply write union S1 union S2. This is union operation. Similarly, intersection. You want to find the common elements, S1 intersection, S2. Three, four, five. Similarly, you can find the elements that are there in S1 and not there in S2. S1 difference, S2. 
the elements that were there in S1, but not there in S2 and so on. So all kind of set operations you can perform, right? People from mathematics, even computer science, uh, theoretical computer science people, they use this idea of sets, in their proofs, in their uh, derivations and so on, right? Yeah, okay. So I have deliberately skipped this because uh, it is simple, right? That's why I skipped. Okay, okay, let us move on. Okay, so so far we have covered lists, triples, sets. Now let me introduce one more uh, collection data type. This is called dictionary. So what is this dictionary? So this dictionary is used to store key value pairs. Key value pairs means what? In database, we store records, right? Each record can be accessed using a key, right? Each record can be uniquely accessed using something called key. So key will uniquely identify the key will uniquely identify the record. So let us say the uh, record is our personal information. So our personal information can be uniquely accessed using the number, right? So these are called key. Value is the record. Key is the entity using which you can uniquely identify the record. So if you want to store these key value pairs, then the best data structure is this dictionary. Now let us de define a dictionary. Suppose you want to define a dictionary, simply use this, these codes. So this, this curly braces will give you dictionary. Now let me define a dictionary. Let us say, let me define a dictionary based on, let me define a dictionary based on ID number, let us say. So first what I use in the dictionary format appears like this, key. Let us say key number is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is my key. Let us say student ID, this is student ID. Let me store the information. So information means what record, let us say. So let me store everything like this. What is, uh, is what is is marks let us say let us say marks of 10 so five, six, five, four subjects let us say 34 45 34 45 okay let's go 30, 34 45 67 78 89 right so this is on record this is the key these are the marks of this marks associated with this student id Similarly, one more key, let us say two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let us say the marks associated with the with this student can be, uh, we are storing here in this list. Let us say 45, 56, 58, 78, 79. How many? One, two, three, four, five. So let me find this. Is it clear now you see what is there in D? It is a dictionary. So this is the key, this is the value. So this is the key, this is the value. Now can we can we access the elements? So if you want to access the element, you pass the key. Suppose you wanted to access the record with key, one, two, three, four, five. You can simply pass the key, you can access the record. Are we clear with this dictionary? Using key, you can access. So basically, there is no ordering, but you can access the elements using key. Is it clear? If you give D of zero, then what it will give? It will throw some error. Okay, key error. Because the elements of dictionary can be accessed only using key. Now, is it heterogeneous? It is heterogeneous. This you can simply check with this. Let us say it is 4.5. Let me give here some string also. Let us say fail. So this will tell us that, this will tell us that it is heterogeneous, right? 
the record, in record we are storing floating point values, integers, strings, and so on. So it is heterogeneous. Not ordered, but you can access the elements using Any questions so far? Now the next question is, does it support duplicates? Does it support duplicates? You give like this. Let me give the same record here. Let me give the same record here and we'll see what happens. Does it support? Yes, it supports, right? Because it is, these are actually key value pairs. Right now, if you access D, what is there in D? Same thing. This is also this value also same. This value also same. So values can be same, but what happens if you use same key? Now let us see. Can we use duplicate keys? Obviously no. Right? One two three four five six. Let me go. One two three four five six. Now what happens when you use duplicate keys? It is working, but you see the content of D. The content of D is only one record. Whatever is the last one, here both are same. So the last record will be means this record was all written with this one. So what is the conclusion? It supports duplicates, but it supports duplicate values only. It does not support duplicate keys. This is obvious. It is heterogeneous, no order, no order, but you can access the elements using keys. Any questions so far? Okay, so heterogeneous, no order, no ordering, supports duplicate values, but does not support duplicate keys. What is the last thing that was there? Can we add elements? Can we delete elements? Right? Means can we add new records? Yes, we can add new records. So this is the content of D, right? Let me add new record. To add new record, you simply give two, three, four, five, six equals to. Let me give the same thing. Uh, let me change. Let me change and give this one. Let me give. You see, second record was added. Earlier, only one record was there. Now we were able to able to add the second record. If you want to add one more record, simply add like this. So we were able to add records, right? Now, can we update record? Yes, now we'll update. We'll try to update. What I'm doing with this key two, three, four, five, six. Let me instead of five, let me give five, five, five. See, earlier it was five, now it was updated to five, five, five. So the record was changed. Is it clear? So we were able to add new records. We were able to update existing records also. What is the last thing? Can we delete? Yes, you can delete also using pop function. Simply pass a, simply pass the key. Now let me pass. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. See, this is the record that was deleted. Now you can see what is there in D. See, it was deleted, right? Only one element was there, one key, one value. So let me paste all these things. You can try your own. Now. So which one I posted? I posted this one. You can see, you can access all this on your screen. In your Google Collab. And you can see the output of all these commands. So it is basically mutable. You can add new records, you can update existing records. 
right you can delete existing records also if you have any questions so far i'll take this collection data types i hope you understood the difference between list tuple set and dictionary also all those things if you see the features of all these things then you will understand the character or whether it is heterogeneous or not heterogeneous whether it is ordered or not ordered whether it supports duplicate elements or not for duplicate elements, whether it is mutable or immutable any questions so far is it necessary that square packet should have equal number of elements here okay this square brackets not necessarily not necessary acha tatu you can check on your screen you run a command like this with a different number of elements in the square brackets right if you see this is a list we have already discussed the idea of this list right so in place of list you can give a dictionary itself also that's why it is heterogeneous right here you can give a single element here you can give list of element you can give a dictionary also what should be the max size of the size of the dictionary you can add elements it depends on the memory right as long as memory is available you can add uh, more and more number of these records okay so if we are done with this then we'll move on should i go ahead okay so this python supports if statements else statements else if statements also so similarly python supports for loops and while loops It does not support do while loop so let me introduce this uh, if loop and uh, for loop please because we don't have much time i have to talk about this numpy also so let me directly introduce for loop so in python the for loop can be written like this for i in range of and the basic way i am showing i am showing the basic way so print i so this is equivalent to what this is equivalent to this one let me write so in python you can write comments using this hash so this is equivalent to for i runs from 0 i less than 10 i less than 10 i Plus plus. So that means what? So to understand, you have to know about function range of ten. What this range of function will give? First, let me introduce this. Then let me discuss about this for. So if you see the output of this range of ten, let me show you in a list so that it will it will be visible to you. So I am simply converting into a list. The output I am converting into a list. So what is output of this function? It will return numbers, integers from zero to nine. So therefore, you see, this is equivalent to for i runs from zero, i less than ten. And what is the step length? Step length means what? After zero, where it will go? Zero plus one, one plus one, two, two plus one, three, and so on. So this is equivalent to this one. Is it clear? So in is the keyword. So that means what? How exact it will work for each element in the output. What is the output of this one? This list, right? So for each element from this output, so i becomes first initially i becomes zero, then i becomes one, then i becomes two, then i becomes three, and so on. I am printing the value of i. If you see the output is simple, zero to nine. Now 
there are different variations of this range. Now, if I supply one here, what happens? It will generate numbers from one to nine. So therefore, this is equivalent to what? This is equivalent to for i equals to one, i less than ten, i plus plus. So this is like initialization. So i will be initialized to one. If you do not supply the first argument, it will be initialized to zero. You can write here two. What happens? You can see. Let me give four. What happens? You see, it will generate numbers from four to nine. So this is like initializing i. So I will start at four. I will go up to nine. Now we have one more variation of this range. What is that? That is step length. So let me give one here. One ten step length. Let me give two. Now first it will start at one. So from one where it will jump? It will jump the step length. So one plus two. Then from three it will go to five. From five it will go to seven. From seven it will go to nine. After nine, nine plus two is eleven. So therefore it will break. Is it clear? These three variations. So it is like i less i runs from one i less than ten is equivalent to i equals to i plus two. Is it clear? This range statement. So it supports three range statements. Now you may ask how the how exactly it is working. When you are giving one input, it is working. When you are giving two inputs, it is working. When you are giving three, it is working. So Python supports something called default arguments. So that means when you doesn't supply the first argument, it will take an initial value zero. Similarly, when you doesn't supply this third argument, third argument, it will take the step length as one. So the default value of Initial uh, position is zero, and the default value of step length is one. So now, if you apply here, let me give a range of two comma ten. What happens? We'll print values from two to nine. You see here, this is the syntax. For is the keyword, in is the keyword. Here we have to give some iterator. Now you have to use this colon symbol, and one more thing you have to remember is. All the statements inside this for loop should be one tab inside this for. That means what happens when you write like this? It will throw error, saying that indentation error, expected and indented block. Since this is part of this for loop, it should be one tab inside this for. Is it clear? Now let me show you one more thing. Print i plus one. Now what happens? You tell me. Now what happens here? It will i and i plus one. So initial value of i is two. So let me go up to four so that it will be easier for you. So initial value of i is two, two, three, three, four. It printed. Now what happens when you remove the indentation here? Can you see here? So i when i is two, it was printing two. When i is three, it is printing three. So it will only run for two and three, right? So when it came out of the loop, the value of i is three. So this statement is outside this for loop. Did you got the idea? So this is outside the for loop. This is not part of for loop. Only this statement is part of the for loop. Is it clear? Because like our other programming languages, we are not using this kind of structure, right? So. Another programming language, we use these curly braces. This curly braces indicates that this is part of R. But here we are not using any braces, right? So therefore, we use this this indentation. So this is part of this buffer for loop. This is not part of for loop. This is outside the for loop. Are we clear? Any questions here? You can see here in the front. Any questions on this for loop? You think that there is no initialization here, no increment or decrement. Everything was part of this. You see here. So that's why I have shown you these three for range states. 
Any questions? Okay, if no questions, then let's go ahead with uh, this NumPy. Let me go to this NumPy library. Now, Python has a rich set of libraries. One of the libraries is NumPy library. So this NumPy library was designed to perform fast computations with numbers. That means what if you have some numbers and you want to perform some operations with numbers, then this NumPy is the best library for those kind of computations. So in Python, you can import a library using this statement, import NumPy. So this input NumPy is similar to your hash include stdio.h, right? What happens when you use this hash include stdio.h? You can use all the functions inside the library, right? Is it not? So similarly, if you want to use all the functions in this library, you can import the library. Now, how to use functions in this library? You can simply write numpy dot, we have a function called array. So what it will do, it will convert, whatever you give, it will convert into a array, numpy array. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Right, this way, so you see, first import the library, then numpy dot, you can call the function name. You can call the function name. But every time you have to use this numpy. So to avoid this, to avoid this, generally, the commonly used import statement is import numpy as np. So this is the shortcut notation for numpy. So instead of writing numpy every time, you can write np. Is it clear the difference between these two import statements? Is it clear first of all, the difference between these two importing statements? Any confusion here? You see, if you import like this, then you have to, if you want to use some function, you have to write numpy.array. If you write like this, then instead of writing numpy, you can use this shortcut name np. Is it clear? Now there are other ways of importing also. From numpy import star array, let me directly copy paste. Now what is this? From numpy library, we are importing everything. So if you import this way, then there is no need of calling np.array. You can directly use the function name. Is it clear the difference between these three importing statements? So here you are importing all the functions inside numpy. That's all. All the functions inside numpy. Is it clear, first of all? Okay, so this numpy has many built-in functions to creating these arrays, numpy arrays. So if you see this numpy array is like your arrays, it is homogeneous. This was designed, this was designed to perform numerical computations very quickly, right? But it is homogeneous. Either you can create an numpy array with all integers, all floating point values, like that. It, it is not heterogeneous. First of all, you have to understand that. 
now if you want to create a numpy array let us say there are many built-in functions now let me import first import numpy as np this is the commonly used import statement np dot there are many functions in this numpy you see absolute value this is used to compute absolute value of numpy array np dot add np dot arc cos right arc cos h sin sin h tan tan to tan h array to string all these functions are available you see there are many functions arc sort arc max arc min you can explore all these functions but let me let me show you some functions at least np dot array let us say let me give this only let me write here array now suppose you want to compute sum of the elements inside this array you simply write np dot sum np dot sum is not working where is this oh here there is a issue Numpy dot array it should be only one array. Can you see this? One? You are able to compute the sum of elements inside this array. If you want to compute maximum, simply write np dot max, np dot min, np dot arg max, all these things, right? np dot np dot arg max. So the place where the maximum element is present. It is at index four. Can you see this? Np dot mean, np dot median, np dot mean, np dot median, standard deviation. All these things you can find. See, this is the standard deviation. Last one it is showing. Is it clear? So this was designed. Perform past computations with numerical data. Now you can create random arrays, random matrices using this numpy. Let us say you want to create a numpy in integers in the range. You want to arrange. Let us say you want to arrange integers between zero and one hundred, means zero and ninety-nine, right? So first, let us see what it will generate. So this a range function it will generate numbers from zero to ninety-nine with the interval of one. That means zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. Now suppose you want to convert this, you want to rearrange this in a matrix shape, simply called reshape function. Reshape ten by ten. Suppose you want to divide them into ten by ten matrix. Matrix. You see, we have a matrix. Of ten by ten, with elements from zero to ninety-nine. Is it clear? Similarly, similarly, this is you see what is this? These are integers between zero and hundred. Now suppose you want to generate numbers between zero and one, means uh, fractional values. Right, that that can be done using this lin space function. So linearly separated data. It is linearly separated data. Suppose you want to generate between zero and ten. You want to generate fifty samples. How they how they should look like? They should be linearly separated. That means what? Between zero and zero point. You see, between zero and ten, fifty samples means what? Zero and one, five samples. One and two, five samples. Two and three, five samples. Three and four, five samples, and so on. Again, between zero and zero point two, one sample. Zero point two and zero point four, one sample. Zero point four and zero point six, one sample. Zero point six and zero point eight, one sample, and so on. So this is called linearly separated data or linearly spaced data. Now this can be again reshaped using this reshape function. Reshape. 
let us say this the how many samples were there 50 samples were there suppose you want to convert it to 5 by 10 it will it will convert into matrix this is the first first one first row this is the second row this is the third row this is the fourth row and so on is it clear are we clear now this is linearly separated data you want random data we have a function called np dot random dot random suppose you want 50 samples between 0 and 1 you simply call np dot random dot random it will generate 50 samples now you can reshape it reshape and you can arrange them in 10 by 5 like a 5 a 10 by 5 matrix 10 rows with four five columns is it clear any questions here is it clear yeah now suppose you want here you see we got all fractional values suppose you want random integers we have function for that also what is that np dot random dot rand int suppose you want to generate 100 numbers between 0 and 5000 100 random numbers between 0 and 5000 simply give 0 and 5000 100 so you want 100 numbers between 0 and 5000 it will generate you can reshape so this way you can generate this random data if you have some existing data then you can perform various computations min max standard deviation mean mean median max arc max arc min some count there are many tasks right i have shown you the list of uh, functions that can be performed in an numpy array so all those functions were readily available you can simply call them with a single uh, command so it will perform entire computation for you are we clear okay if you are done with this if you are clear with this then let me go on to this tensors let me introduce tensors at the end because it was nearly five o'clock so tensors now what are these tensors basically tensor is a high dimensional vector or high dimensional matrix basically so tensor is generalization of your arrays or matrices so you can say that tensor is a multi-dimensional matrix or multi-dimensional array now how to create these tensors this is the question now so so far what we have created using this number a we have created one dimensional array and then two dimensional array also we have created right now let us go to this high dimensional array now how to create this high dimensional array in numpy let us call the high dimension if the high dimensional array is a tensor then how to create this tensor in using numpy using numpy you can create this tensor very easily let us say let me generate a random data right let me generate let me generate random uh, random tensor between 0 and uh, 5000 let me generate 0 and 50000 let me generate 10000 samples then i reshape i reshape it into 10 by 10 by 10 that means what three dimensions right 10 by 10 by 10 now you see it is difficult to see the entire content also see Three dimensions you see this was the first one inside this again 10 10 10 10 10 it will go like this 10 by 10 by 10 so i'm uh, it is difficult to visualize uh, it is three dimensional but what we have generated is essentially a tensor because tensor is a high dimensional vector You want me to post this? Yeah.
So this way you can create pen charts using NumPy, right? Basically, this is a high dimensional. Uh, so we have this tensor. You can perform various operations. Now let let us say we have two tensors. Let us say this is T1. T1 equals to this one. And let me create one more tensor. T2. T2. So let me generate this between uh, what? 20,000, let us say. V shape. This is also a random tensor. T1 and T2. Now we can perform various tensor operations like adding these tensors, subtracting these tensors, right? And then multiplying these tensors. All these things can be performed easily. Uh, how to perform these? Uh, these things is very simple. Suppose you want to perform addition, adding these tensors, element by element addition. T1 plus T2. It will add these tensors. Right? Similarly, subtraction. You want to perform T1 minus T2. T1 minus T2. Uh, multiplication. Multiplication of these uh, tensors is also simple. Simple multiplication. Division you can perform. All these operations can be simply performed using this operations. Right? So we can create using NumPy, you can create high dimensional tensors and then you can perform various operations on these tensors. Is it okay? If are we done? Any questions so far? There are many operations that can be performed using NumPy, but due to this lack of time, I'm not covering everything. Any questions? Can we visualize this 3D? Yeah, visualization is a different aspect. Visualization, there is a library called Matplotlib. Matplotlib supports 2D visualization and 3D visualization. Right? Yeah, using Matplotlib, you can uh, you can show the three-dimensional figure, figure also. Line chart, bar charts, pie charts, surface plots, different kind of plots you can draw. Surface, surface plots also you can draw. Okay. So, so far, if you are not, okay, please give a short overview of comments that from starting. Okay, you want me to give some overview? That is good, okay, let me give. Tensors, okay, let me give a few commands, then I will give overview. Uh, I will share this workbook also, don't worry. But let me give a few more commands. Now, using NumPy, we can create these tensors, right? High dimensional tensor, that's all, three dimensional, four dimensional, high dimensional, whatever it may be. Now, similarly, we have one more library called TensorFlow. Import TensorFlow as TF. That means this is the library name, and I'm using this shortcut name, TF, right? Now, using this library also, we can create tensors. So, this TensorFlow library is very useful for deep learning and artificial neural network based applications. Many machine learning and deep learning applications were built inside this TensorFlow library, right? So that, that's why I, let me introduce how to create tensors using this library also, right? So if you want to create a one-dimensional tensor, one-dimensional tensor, right? you can zero-dimensional tensor. What is zero-dimensional tensor? Zero-dimensional tensor means it is a constant, one value, one scalar value. Let us say you want to create a zero dimensional tensor. You give a constant value. So this is T0, zero dimensional tensor. Right? If you want to see what is there in T0, you can see. You see the contents of T0? It is a tensor, you see. It is not just array or uh, matrix. Was saying that is it? It is a tensor, and its shape. What is the shape? Shape is zero because it is a single element. 
right? This is the cap type integer with 32 bits, right? Now let me create one more tensor. If you want to create a tensor, a one dimensional tensor means a vector you want to create, right? Let me pass a list now. One. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, let me write T1, okay, T1. So it is one dimensional tensor. Now you see, what is the shape? Shape is six, right? Shape means number of elements, right? And it is a tensor, you see, can you see? Right, similarly, you want to create a two dimensional tensor, three dimensional tensors, you can create using this TF dot constant. You can give values, you can pass the values. Here you can give, what? You can give the NumPy array also. You can give whatever you want, you can give, it will convert. So let me give a two dimensional. So how to give a two dimensional tensor here? A two dimensional NumPy array, np dot, random values, random dot, randint between zero and uh, let us say 5,000. Let me generate 100 numbers, right? Then let me convert into, let me convert into 10 by 10. So it is a two dimensional NumPy array. I'm converting into this tensor. Can you see? What is the shape? Shape is 10 by 10. It is a tensor, 10 by 10. Can you see this 10 by 10? Right? Similarly, if you want to create a three dimensional tensor, four dimensional tensors, you can create using this tensor flow also. So let me give you thousand numbers. Let me generate and let me generate 10 by 10 by 10. See it is, you can see the description at the beginning. That is, it is a tensor. Basically these are tensors. Earlier, earlier when we created something using NumPy, when we created something using NumPy, although we are calling it as tensor, but they are not tensors. You see here, what is type of T1? What is type of T1? You can see here. It is a NumPy array. That's all. It was not telling that it is a tensor. But using this tensor flow, when you create something, it was telling you that it is a tensor. You see. Suppose when you create this one, and if you see the type of T1, it is a tensor flow, right? Tensor, eager tensor, it is a tensor. So using this, so the entire tensor library, PyTorch library, they were built on top of these tensors. So they perform multiple operations with these tensors. So let me quickly summarize what we have discussed as suggested by someone. So first we started with these basics of Python, how to create a variable and assign value there is no need of declaring the data type of the value data type of the variable because python is dynamically type language so there is no need to define the data type it will auto come automatically input the data type right and python is uh, based on interpreter so you simply write something and run. you can directly run there is no need to also right so then what we have seen we have seen how to write strings in python single code, double code, triple code. The difference between single code and double code, double code and triple code. So triple code is used to store paragraph. Double code is for line or line containing uh, single quotes and so on. Single code was designed for a simple string without any white spaces. Although it works, if there are workspaces, white spaces, but there are some limitations with single code. Then we have discussed these collection data types, list, tuples, set, dictionary. So basically list is heterogeneous, ordered, mutable, and it supports duplicate elements also. Whereas tuple, it is heterogeneous, ordered, it is immutable, and it supports duplicate elements. Coming to set, set is heterogeneous, unordered, does not support duplicates, and it is mutable. You can add elements, you can delete elements also. 
coming to dictionary it is heterogeneous no order but you can access elements using key right and it is mutable you can add elements update elements delete elements also and it supports duplicate values it does not support duplicate keys so these are the collection data types we have uh, discussed so coming to list we have seen the functions right such as creating a list accessing elements based on index accessing last element based on negative index accessing some set of elements from the list this is called slicing right then adding an element at the end adding an element based on index right and then finding the index of an element if you give an element using this function you can find index of the element you can remove element from the end you can remove element based on index you can remove element based on content also so all these functions we have discussed similarly coming to tuple only functions that is supported by this tuple is index and count index is used to find the index of the element count using count you can count the number of times an element appears in the tuple to set so using this uh, function set you can create a set since it is unordered you won't be able to access indexes but you can add element but it will be added somewhere that's all there is no ordering no ordering means what there is no concept of first last or uh, some place there is no concept of place you can remove an element you can remove an element based on content you pass some element it will remove similarly dictionaries we have seen so i have introduced this idea of for loop in python this is very simple based on this range function there are other ways of writing a for loop also you can pass a dictionary here you can pass a list here all these things but due to lack of time i have not covered all those things but important thing to be remember is python is based on indentation so you see here this statement is not part of for loop but this is part of for loop so you have to always maintain indentation while writing functions while writing loops and so on then i have introduced this numpy library there are different ways to import these libraries right there are three ways i have shown you there is, there is one more way i have not shown and then using this np.array you can create numpy array this numpy array was numpy is a library for performing numerical computations that means it is a library for performing computations on numerical data it supports various uh, functions to perform different kind of operations few of the operations i have shown here but there are many operations which we have not covered here and then the functions like range reshape was covered here so this was used to generate integers between 0 and 100 this was equally spaced because 0 1 2 3 and so on right now if you want to generate fractional numbers equally spaced fractional numbers we use this lint space we will generate 50 numbers between 0 and 10 right using this free shape you can convert these numbers into a matrix of shape 5 by 10 it will generate random integers between 0 and random numbers between 0 and 1 it will generate integers between 0 and 5000 how many integers 100 integers right now finally i have introduced this tensor flow library for creating the real tensors although tensor is a high dimensional uh, vector but numpy will always return a array it will always say that it is a numpy array it is not a tensor but if you want to create a real tensor you can go for this tensor flow library or pytorch library i have shown i have demonstrated how to create tensors using this tensor flow library So, if you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you, sir. Hello, uh, for yeah. your nice uh, interactive session. Uh, students have uh, participants and students have uh, uh, enjoyed very well. Now, I am opening uh, for the question and answer session. If uh, any participants are having any query, 
they can raise their hand and ask the question to the sir and they their question has to be in brief so, because we are already running out of the time yes any participants who want to ask they can raise their hand ah uh, vijay vijay lakshmi ya ma'am vijay lakshmi ya ma'am are you there you can ask the question to the sir हेलो उपासना मैम यू कैन आस्क द क्वेश्चन टू द सर प्रभजोत कौर ओके सर आई राव सर यस सर Uh, there is a general request that if you can share us with uh, some of the handout if you are having with related to this uh, topic so that we can share with the participants yeah yeah i will share the tutorials some uh, part we can say not python notebooks we will share okay sir yeah. share, uh, I, hello ha uh, rao yeah, sir yeah, please uh, yeah, yeah. please share in uh, my whatsapp number na yeah yeah please fine Please. I will share this notebook also, the today's notebook also. In addition, I will show you some of the other notebooks. Pay that. Ah, चले गए. It's okay, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rao, for speaking at uh, uh, one week at the FDP organized by the Rungta College of Engineering and Technology, Bhilai. Your presentation on the uh, Python and its various uh, applications were uh, quite uh, knowledgeable and was interactive. and was very well received by our participant thank you sir and yeah, thank uh, you sir thank, thank you for inviting me at this uh, friday at the fdp on patient plans thank you thank you Deep very much sir and, uh, yeah. and i request the participants to join us again tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock uh, sharp in the morning we will notify the uh, name of the speaker in the whatsapp group that we are having thank you very much we will join tomorrow thank you very much thank you all